Good morning, LBC Radio. My name is Corey Rosen, and you're listening to The Story Podcast. Today, I have on a super awesome guest, but before we get into that, if you would really like to support the show, we have some merchandise over at facebook.com forward slash the story Corey Rosen. If you want to buy stickers, t-shirts, or hoodies with the logo on the front and the first 50 guests on the back, you can do so. Please, please know that this is a limited time offer. They will supply and first come, first serve until supplies last. With that said... I have on Miss Jen Felty. Jennifer, a Lancaster County native, had a love for musical theater and sports at a very young age. She spent her childhood on the stage, the soccer field, the volleyball and basketball court, and behind the piano or cello. Despite the pleadings of her coaches and directors, she continued playing sports, doing theater, and doing music all at the same time. She excelled at soccer in college, where she gained an all-American status her senior year. She has a bachelor's degree and vocal performance from Houghton. Houghton. I was about to say Houghton. Houghton, Houghton College slash University, <laughs> New York, a second bachelor's degree in business administration and Bible from LBC, and a master's of music degree in vocal performance and pedagogy from Penn State. Jen has performed in numerous musicals as well as opera productions in, in regional theaters. Her favorites include Denise in Smoke on the Mountain, Carrie in Carousel, and singing while playing the banjo, fiddle, and upright bass at the Grand Old Opry, and accompanying TV program, Opry Backstage. Most recently, she has been focusing on directing shows, teaching voice, and managing the careers of her two children. You can find Jen and her projects on her Facebook or Instagram at Red Accordion Studios or website www.redaccordion.com. With all that said, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. good. <laughs> You're like, I got through that, I got so I'm through good. <laughs> right. That's, that's, that's half the battle of this podcast is just getting all of that correctly in one smooth flow. Yeah. It doesn't happen all the time. Sorry, nailed it. <laughs> so what was it, do you think, as a, as a child that sparked your theater, your acting bug? I, I Probably church. Hmm. Um, so singing in the church choir um, called God's Notes. It's like the little kids choir at our church. And I know our church did musicals every year. And as a kindergartner, I was asked to play like the young role in the show. And um, I guess that's what did it. I don't know. It's kind of funny. I like I have this crazy music memory. So I remember exactly what I had to sing in that show. (laughs) Wow. And I know it's so weird. Um, And it was also a weird song. It was like a biblical times thing. And. Yeah, so I guess that's what started it. I didn't do as much theater as kids these days do mm. growing up. Like, I don't remember doing a whole lot other than at church until I was in high school. So what was it in high school that you started out as? High school, so I was an athlete, as mentioned in my bio. And I think it was it was my choir director that was like, hey, why don't you try out for the musical? Like, after getting to know me freshman year. And I was like, well, I play basketball. Like, that's during musical season. I can't mm-hmm. I can't do both. And it's like, well, you should you should quit basketball and do this. And I was like, um. <laughs> so I don't I don't know what that whole thought process was, but I do remember that my dad was you know a little upset that I quit basketball because that mm-hmm. was his sport, uh, his main sport. So quit basketball and picked up volleyball instead because you know why, why not? not? Right. So it was volleyball, musical, and soccer for my my time in high school, and so sophomore year was my first. Big musical. That's so. that's a lot. Because I remember doing soccer and the theater at the same time, and that was a lot. Yeah, they didn't they didn't overlap. Like yeah. I was still in choir and orchestra, and by that point, my piano teacher had dropped me because mm. she actually said to me when I was in eighth grade, "You need to either quit some of these sports or quit piano," and that was upsetting to me so (laughs) i'm quitting you well we're just gonna quit piano so that's what happened there but um yeah so they didn't really overlap until musical overlapped with soccer for a week Mm. and my soccer coach was like hey if you come in here and you're in shape you know then it's it's fine but you got to come in and and run the mile in whatever time it was and at that point in my life that was not a problem it would be today (laughs) if i had to go do that but it yeah. was a problem for me back then. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
We're all a little different, but. <laughs> so, uh, from there, what did you do? Did you uh, you did you excel at the theaters in high school? Um. Yes, I suppose so. Um, it so. was. What did you? What I said did I had imagined. So. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, I'm trying to think. We did Babes in Arms, which is like an obscure show. My sophomore year, my junior year, we did Stephen Sondheim's Follies, which is another show I have to see. Oh my goodness! <laughs> but here's the thing: it's it's an incredible show, but it's a very, I would I'd say adult show, and I don't mm. necessarily mean by content, but mature. It's yeah, very mature and crazy to think about a group of high schoolers putting on the show. Mm. Um, but the reason that uh, the director, who was Alan Mudrick, the reason he decided to do it was we were they were building a new performing arts center at Hempfield. I went to Hempfield High School. So that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> they were building a new performing arts center. So this was going to be the last show in the Hackman Auditorium. And Follies is about a reunion of a theater, um, all the showgirls, like Zigfield Follies kind of thing. Um all the showgirls came back and the actors and dancers and for this big reunion because they were going to tear the theater down and mm. make it a parking lot. And so that was his reason for doing the show. The show is brilliant. It's like a you have flashbacks. So you have all of the actors like as, you know, their older selves and then the younger oh, version yes. of them. Yeah. yeah. So kind of like ghostly figures. That's so cool. I was like the ghostly opera lady, which I was upset about because I wanted a bigger role. <laughs> But it was a very specific <laughs> skill set needed to sing that very high soprano role. So, sure. Anyway, but yeah, so that was the last one. And then, so I performed in the first show in what is still there, the Performing Arts Center at Hempfield, which was Pirates of Penzance. And I was Mabel. So that was the lead of the show. So, awesome. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, so is that is, did. was it at that point that you decided that's what you wanted to do forever or? Um, I was going between a degree in medicine of some sort, biology, mm. possibly becoming a surgeon, <laughs> um, and psychology and music. So those were the three areas that I was considering. And my junior year, I was on a missions trip in Venezuela. It was actually a sports outreach oh, wow. missions trip. Um, so... It was during that trip, so played all the sports, and then the last night, they kind of opened up to anybody who would want to sing or whatever, so I was like, oh, I'll sing a song. So I sang, and they like looked at me like, why Why didn't you let us know you could sing? I'm like, I'm here to play sports, like I'm mm -hmm. playing the sports. And so anyway, through all of that, like God just kind of spoke to me and said, just sing. I was like, okay, <laughs> what do I do with that? What, does that, what mean? does that mean? That was, it was weird. Cause like I had never really experienced anything like that before. So I decided to major in music and decided that going to school for vocal performance would teach me what I need to know to have longevity in the career mm. and know how to take care of my instrument and all of that kind of thing. And there weren't a ton of musical theater programs at that time either. So was kind of why I decided on the music route um, and then had an issue because I knew I was going to play soccer in college. So then it was trying to figure out, OK, well, how how big do I go with either one? Like, where do I go? Because I was recruited a little bit for some D1 schools and knew that I couldn't make music happen there. And right. so I was trying to make that decision, finding that balance. And um, my high school soccer coach, who actually coaches the guys now at Hemfield, he went to Houghton and he told me, he's like, hey, you should check out Houghton. They have a great music program and great soccer team. And mm -hmm. so I got the best of both worlds there. That's awesome. So what does it mean to be on the All-American as it, like a senior year? So they, I don't even really know how they choose it based on your stats, I guess, and whatever else. So they choose kind of like, it's kind of like an all-star team. Yeah. So, but it's just like all of America. <laughs> <laughs> so they choose. <laughs> they choose the players that I guess excelled for that year and what was your position um I think I think it was forward forward okay senior. it's so funny um it, my soccer coach has now moved to a different school but and Houghton has come to play LBC oh. so 
I see him every other year when they would come down to play LBC and he would just like talk to my kids or my husband and just rattle off all of this stuff that I did. And I don't remember any of it. Wow. Like it's so funny because it was so important to me at that time. And yet I don't know. He's like, oh yeah, remember that game when you score? I was like, no, no, <laughs> no, I don't remember that. So yeah, my senior year, I actually got hurt. Um, in a preseason game, a mm. bad ankle injury. It wasn't broken, but it was bad enough that I spent practices in the training room, either in the pool or the bike or whatever, trying to stay in shape. And then I would play games. <laughs> so wow. somehow that was a good combination because I had a pretty amazing senior year. Like it was, yeah, it was crazy. Oh, that's so, awesome. Yeah, I was like regional player of the week twice and national player of the week once. And really? Yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> I right, think, yeah. I don't know. I probably scored a lot of goals or had a lot of, si- of assists or something. But yeah, so that was, that was that. But I will say like the one thing that stuck with me from soccer and my coach was, I joke that he's Reverend Dr. Coach David Lewis. <laughs> Um, <laughs> try to put them in the right order. Right. Um, and God first, degree second. Yeah. So. <laughs> so I, the one we lost, we lost a really big game. Mm. And again, don't remember much about it other than we were all devastated and there were lots of cheers. And I remember him saying like, what is this loss in light of eternity? Mm. And at the time, I was like, oh, God, and if we're, if we lost, it's awful. Like, <laughs> the worst thing in the world. And right. now, like, I can't even give you any details about it at all. Other than I knew we were upset, and but that's what I remember. So that's kind of the takeaway. Like, something that seems so big and so important to you right now that you don't get or that you lose or that, you know, bad that happens to you, it's not going to be – it's not going to feel that bad forever. And what is that in light of eternity? Right. Like, it's not – so – Yay, lesson. coach. Thanks for the, the words of wisdom there. He's an awesome guy. Yeah. Still in touch with him, so it's very cool. So what was your college experience like at uh, Houghton then? Um, it was a little crazy. Like I had mentioned um, in my bio, when I when I went there to interview and to audition, the I thought, I'm not sure if he was the head of the music department at the time. He might have been. He was like, you, you can't major in music and play soccer. It's like, oh. Why, why not? <laughs> right, right. And so I don't know how I ended up doing it anyway. Um, but And it took a while. I think I had to prove myself to everybody. Mm. And then the music people would start coming to the soccer games. And, of course, like my soccer, my soccer team came to all of my performances and stuff like that. And it's a small school. It's 1,200 students. So Awesome. Yeah. Um, so it was a lot to juggle. And I won't say that I had the best grades ever because, you know, Priorities. There was a lot going on. Yep. Um, I I mean I did I did fine, but right. um, it was just kind of funny because then I went to grad school and had like a four point oh until my son was born, and then I think my final GPA was like three point eight five, uh, having a baby like my last semester. <laughs> so oh, wow. um, it's yeah, it, priorities and priorities whatever. Yeah. Right. <laughs> also very busy, obviously with with both things, but. Yeah, so my time at Houghton was great. I was burnt out with soccer by the time I got to school mm. and had to play because it was helping to pay for college. Um, but I would not – I wouldn't do it differently. Like my coach alone and then um, just my friends and that support system. And then having like the best of both worlds with friends, yeah. <laughs> with like the athletes and then the musicians <laughs> because they're very different. Very different. Yeah, so it just gave me that – that balance, I guess. That's awesome. What do you think was the top things that you learned from college in regards to your career? My career. Hmm. I think that you you have to you have to advocate for yourself and you have to just you have to put in the work mm. and go for it. So my voice teacher um, was amazing. It clearly God had a great plan for my life and, you know, had Dr. King as my voice teacher. Um, I learned so much from him, but he was also the only teacher that would allow musical theater to be sung there because it's a very classical school. Um, 
So yeah, it was almost like, hey, how do you get to sing musical theater stuff? (laughs) It's just like, well, that's what I want to do. And he was willing to allow me to do that. But when it came to my career, it was like, hey, I want to try to get a theater job this summer. He only knew the opera world. Mm. So that, and again, he was very supportive and the best fit for me. And again, still in touch with him. He came to my wedding. Um, Yeah, uh, great guy. But I had to do the research. I had to figure out the musical theater world. So I don't. I think that was the best possible thing, though, because I had to do it myself. So what was the one of the, maybe the most challenging things and for you to figure out how to do that? Um, ooh, figuring out. Actually, so there used to be this book, and now it's probably all on the internet. <laughs> um. But there's a book of all the theaters in the country and what shows they would be doing for their season, who to contact to like send audition materials or whatever. So it was in book form. Wow. So whether or not that still exists, I'm not sure, because clearly you can find a lot more on the Internet than you could then. And I had a laptop like. I was like the first class at Houghton to like, hey, here's a laptop when you came in the door. Wow. So it's not like, you know, I'm that old. Um, But it was so looking through that book, finding theaters, filmed my audition because I was in upstate New York, like out in the middle of nowhere, literally out in the middle of nowhere. It surprises me how middle of nowhere you can be in this in New York. Yeah. There was a blinking light the next town over. I, I I went up to New York and it, and I hit gravel roads. Yeah. Not not dirt. Not yeah. not you know regular asphalt, but gravel. It's and I hit. I didn't know you could hydroplane on gravel yeah. <laughs> until then. It's it's scary. Yeah. It is scary. Yeah. So. I, I filmed my audition and sent, and now this is ages me a little bit, sent VHS tapes in the mail. And like, hey, this is going to this theater. This is going to this theater. So I got a call from a theater asking me to send them send them another video. And they wanted Denise's monologue. You know where this is going. Denise's monologue from mm-hmm. Smoke on the Mountain. And I think they wanted to see me playing guitar or something. So I was like, okay. So I tried to find that monologue and could not find it anywhere. Like oh, no. library searches online, couldn't find it. So I was like, well, I'll just put this. Like I almost didn't do it. I was like, well, I'll just give them something. And right. so sent it away. Um, I don't remember what the initial question was, but this is whatever. Um, this this was my first professional job, so this yeah. is kind of a big deal. Um, and so sent the videotape. And I don't remember what time of the year it was. It was probably January, February-ish. What's usually when you start auditioning for summer stuff. I got a phone call on April 1st. So (laughs) April Fool's Day. Right, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And I am literally about to walk out of my dorm room. This is when you had like a landline in your dorm room, which was better than one in the hallway, which, you know, I guess previous to my life at college. Um, I was I had my bags packed, was about to walk out the door to get on the bus to go to the airport and fly to Australia with my soccer team. So my soccer team was going to Australia on a missions trip and okay. we were leaving and it was April 1st. And here's this phone call from this theater in Tennessee saying, hi, we'd like to offer you the role of Denise in Smoke on the Mountain and understudy for Eliza in My Fair Lady. And it starts, you know, this time and this is how much you'll get paid and company housing and da 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 and I'm like what, <laughs> what? <laughs> like, is this is this a joke wait am I allowed to do that who is this the is this a real thing like you know I'm still a who young you? girl I can't I think it was my sophomore year in college my parents had moved to Arizona and from Lancaster and I was like can I do that can I like, can I go live somewhere else in the summer right. and do this and get paid? What? So it was like a, a crazy thing. So I did all the research that I could do. I don't think I gave them an answer until I got back. I don't think, I don't remember. Um, but I ended up doing it. And that was, yeah, that was my first professional gig. So yeah, they were, and they smoke on the mountain has seven people in the cast 
And they're all on stage the whole time. Oh, wow. And it takes place in South Carolina in like the 1930s. And they all play instruments on the stage. And there's like 27 bluegrass gospel songs in the show. And the way that they did it at that theater, they had the exclusive rights to that show in Tennessee. So they had done it forever. And I was going into a production that was already running. And um, they, they put it on that everyone in the show has to play all of the instruments. So I played guitar and piano and cello, which clearly isn't in bluegrass music, and only played guitar enough like that I taught myself right. since I got one when I graduated from high school. Um, so then they're like, oh, you play the cello. Could you pick up the violin? I was like, I can pick it up. I don't know if I right. can play it. <laughs> but So I did. I played the violin in the show and then had to learn banjo and mandolin and upright bass and all of the things. What was that so, process like figuring out those stringed instruments? It was it was interesting. Um, once you play guitar, honestly, like it's a secret. It's actually easy to play the other instruments. <laughs> I had figured that out. Yeah. Yeah. So, but to like learn all of the songs and memorize them, and they all have the same chord structure. It's like one four five, like oh, mostly. Okay, so. so it's like, oh wait, what key does this start in? And then wait, this song is over. What in, where do I put the instrument down? Where do mm. I get my next instrument? What key is it in? It was more all of the logistics. Yeah. Was... So a bunch of the people in the cast were going to Florida. Um, there was like a couple days of break. And so I went with them and literally sat on a boat and learned to play these instruments. So it was just like... <laughs> here it is play this and so I was just like wait how do you play that chord wait what's that and that was my process that's awesome so I think the accent was actually harder to learn really so it's like a thick country southern accent and you think you could pull it out I well always yeah um but I had to sit across from someone that grew up in that region and she was like, she'd say the word, and I would say it back. And she'd be like, no, and no. say it again. <laughs> and I'm like, what? Like, a feeling like I was doing a pretty good job, and she's not. But, yeah, it's like, um, I have to think of what the, I used to know the monologue, like the back of my hand, and now I can't think of what it is. But uh, my brother Dennis and I are twins. I'm the oldest by four minutes. Dennis and I go to Culloway Bible School. So it's like really hard. Right, and, yeah. yeah. Very much the, the country girl. Yeah. So it was great when we did a show, like we used to travel the show. And when like old ladies would come up to me and be like, I grew up there. You reminded me of my girlfriends when we were. So I was like, wow, I guess I guess I did it. <laughs> yeah. No, I, my family in Texas, they sounded pretty bang on for yeah. what they sound like. Yeah. yeah so. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm curious, what's the process of, of learning different accents? How many accents have you had to learn? Um, I have not. Well, I haven't had to do too many in shows. I For me, it's gotten easier through the years, especially with all of my vocal training, mm. um, with uh, foreign language diction and having to take so many different languages and things like oh, that. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, so it's gotten better. Like my ear is pretty good. Um, most recently I w had to do an Irish accent and then a Ukrainian accent. I think it was Ukrainian, um, for once. Hmm. Um, so I, <laughs> this was, this is another tip. Um, have you ever heard of Fiverr? Yes. Yeah. So I literally went on Fiverr and found someone in the exact region where this character is supposed to be from. And sent him it was a guy I was like that's all right I can deal with a guy saying the words <laughs> as opposed to a girl which is a little different um sent him my my sides like my callback dialogue okay and he, he recorded it for me so then I heard someone from that exact region yeah. <laughs> like doing it it's like I don't think there's any better way to figure this out so that, that's how I had to learn uh, the Scottish action for uh, Shrek. Mm. So he sent me so many DVDs of how to to learn the dic the diction and yeah. and all that stuff because it was just foreign to me. Yeah. Um, literally. Right, li quite literally. <laughs> yes. Uh, stuff that's I didn't do it justice at all because mm -hmm. 
I was busy. <laughs> well, yeah, it does take time. And it does, ta- it takes like the proper model as well. Yeah. So if you're listening, you know, like somebody had mentioned um, earlier when we were talking before the show about Bert in Mary Poppins. Uh, my son played him his freshman year in high school. And, you know, it's like, who do I listen to? <laughs> mm. Do I listen to the Broadway recording? Do I listen to this recording? Like trying to figure out who did it best and right. then, yeah, kind of duplicate that or figure it out on your own. <laughs> so uh, where was this, the the theater that you went to for Denise? This was in Crossville, Tennessee. So it's like <laughs> an hour. Let's see if this is right. I might have it backwards. An hour from Knoxville and two hours from Nashville. Okay. So that's well, where that was. <laughs> what was it like going from uh, New York to Tennessee? That, um, well, because I was out in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> as yeah, far as that goes. Yeah, right. um, I think the, it, the bigger difference there was going from a Christian bubble mm. to the, I love to call it the real world of theater, because um, it's, it's not a real world. It's play. <laughs> it's make believe. But going from yeah, my my Christian bubble to um, cast housing in a regional theater. So that was um, that was it, a very different world, and yet one that I love, <laughs> and one that I I see as a mission field. Mm. So yeah. So what happens next? What happens after that after theater that experience? I did not want to go back to school because I was doing what I wanted to be doing and was making money and they would have kept me there and it was great. <laughs> so it was it was hard to go back to school. Mm. I went back to school and it was it was a struggle um, and uh, tried to get a job, I think, the following summer, like a similar situation and didn't happen the same way. So I went to Arizona for that summer, home, um, had to find, it made some friends like in the young adult group at church, which was great. And yeah. then I decided, well, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to study. So I did um, like a uh, acting on film course and took some dance classes and got new headshots, things like that. So did that until I went back to school my senior year and got a phone call from that theater in oh goodness did they call me maybe in December or January I'm like hey can you come back down and do smoke on the mountain again Again. and uh because it was it was just constantly running okay um and I forget what else they wanted they had for me at that point um but it was so it was my senior year and I was doing my senior recital I think it was like the end of January beginning of February so I stayed at school through my recital, and then I left hmm. my senior year. <laughs> right, of course. So again, I think because Houghton is a smaller school, um, was able to work it out that I finished my classes, um, would email assignments. At that point, I was taking um, a form and analysis class, independent study. Oh, my. So, <sighs> but because it was independent study, right. like it was like all these things kind of, just they were set up for yeah. me to leave and I didn't realize that until it happened um yeah the only thing was like for me to do that independent study class the professor the deal that the professor made with me was that I play cello in the orchestra so kind of left um left him hanging on that one a little bit but um yeah so I left and went down and finished my classes and I flew back to graduate um and went went back down to Tennessee and did you stay for in Tennessee for a long time? I stayed in Tennessee, did a bunch of shows. Um, then they were going to move Smoke on the Mountain to the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville, which is where the Grand Old Opry used to be. Mm-hmm. And they were considering me for the role. <laughs> um, and so at that point, like after that first time down in Tennessee, I went back to Houghton and took violin lessons. So had played it in shows all summer and then was like, I probably should learn how to play. I feel like I might need this again. So I went back and took violin lessons. Why all the way back to Houghton? Well, I mean, when I was in school. So after oh, the okay. first gotcha, time. Gotcha, gotcha, yeah. gotcha. So I went back for my junior year and started taking violin lessons. Gotcha. I also took classical guitar. Um, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> 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 that's 
it's a beautiful instrument, <laughs> but, um, so yeah. So fast forward to after had, having graduated in Tennessee, they want me to, they want to see what's going on. They're like, well, if you get the role, you need to work with a fiddle coach. Mm. So I was like, okay. So they gave me a fiddle coach. Like I didn't have to pay for a fiddle coach. Oh, they gave awesome. me a fiddle coach. And then she's like, you probably should have a better instrument. And I was like, okay, but I don't like, I don't have money. <laughs> right. So they actually helped to pay for my, but it was crazy. Um, they helped to pay for it and I paid them back a little bit. Like, I don't know. They were really great with all of that. That's awesome. So new instrument, fiddle coach, got the role then. So went to Nashville and did Smoke on the Mountain there. And that was probably like the best of my life at, up to that point because <clears throat> I was getting paid very well. And we only had shows Thursday through Sunday. And I had an apartment with uh, like my mom, <laughs> the, the woman who played my mom in the show. Okay. Um, and yeah, so enjoying Nashville and life and doing the show. So how did you go from doing your theater show to the Grand Old Opry? And that TV show. Yeah. So they invited our cast to be to come and perform on the Grand Old Opry. Mm. So they sent a limo and we rode in a limo to the Grand Old Opry, got out with all of our instruments. And <laughs> it was like our family band, as I'm sure, you know, everyone does that goes to play at the at of the course. Opry. It's just we were nobodies. Um, so, yeah. So we did a few songs from the show. In character, in costume, with my lovely blonde wig at the time. It was not lovely at all. It was so bad. My The guy who played my twin brother had blonde hair, and my mother in the show also had blonde hair. So therefore, you had So they have... made me a blonde, yeah. Um, so yeah, we did that, and then we did the, the TV show where they kind of sit and interview and talk to you. And What was all that like? It was, I, I didn't fully... I, I, full, I appreciated the fact that I was on TV. Like, that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, people could watch it. So that was, that was fun. But I didn't fully appreciate the history of mm. and the, the privilege that it was to be even backstage at the Grand Old Opry yeah. and then on stage. I did. And the same thing with the Ryman. I, I, I definitely appreciate all of that so much more now than mm -hmm. I did at that time being 21 <laughs> and um, being a classically trained singer, which was also very interesting because when I first got hired in the role, they're like, oh yeah, it's an alto belt role. I was like, I am a classically trained soprano. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> so I learned, it's so funny when I watch, um, when I watch videos <laughs> from that first summer, Versus when I went back down and started to like understand more and learn better how to belt and do things like that. Right. There was a huge difference. And I can't believe they hired me back after after having me sing like the way I did. It was definitely not 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 OK. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, it was a lot of a lot of learning. Um, but yeah, definitely appreciate the experience more in hindsight than I did in the moment. But, so after that, did you choose to go back to uh, LBC and do music degrees there? No, I was still I was still acting. Um, they hired me. They kept. I mean, they wanted me around, so hey. I kept getting more contracts and more shows with them. And back back in Crossville at the time, um, they actually have actors that I worked with that are still there. Wow. And some that have gone, like my stage manager for the show, stage managed off Broadway and on Broadway, and now he's the artistic director at the theater. Wow. So lots of people still around. It's just that kind of place, and it's a really great place. Um, and Clearly, it must be. Yeah, and I wouldn't be, I wouldn't, wouldn't have had the career that I had or be where I am if it wasn't for that theater. So, and the, yeah, people that cast me initially, of course. But yeah, so I was still down there, and um it, uh, fast forward to October after having graduated college, and that's when um, a friend came to visit me from Lancaster and was like, hey, my friend is in town. We should go hang out with him, and that friend ended up being my husband, um, so that's when I met my husband in um, October, and we got engaged in January, married in August, and then life changed a little bit. 
A little bit. So, yeah. So I was working um, pretty much at that theater while we were dating. And then after we got engaged, January-ish, I was hired at uh, the Barter Theater in Virginia. And that's when I was offered an equity contract. So Mm. I became part of the Actors Union at that point. And it was probably a little early for me to make that jump. But knowing that I was getting married to an equity actor, (laughs) I thought, well, if I ever want to work with him, I'm going to have to to be be. equity. Yeah. So um, I finished my contract there not too long before we got married. The month before we got married, he was offered the Les Mis tour full time. Uh, He had been in and out of the tour just as a substitute um, or covering vacations and things Mm -hmm. like that. So once we got married, then we were on the road with Les Mis. He was in it. I was a wife. And then then I started teaching some people in the cast, um, doing voice lessons, and actually taught violin to um, one of the young Cosette Eponine girls in the show. Wow. Who ironically, like we just kind of just reconnected with, and uh, she's going to be performing at um, Radio City in the Christmas show this year. So wow, yeah. So it's, it's crazy to meet people you meet. Yeah, yeah, crazy, crazy life. So yeah, that's. Uh, I went back to that theater then. I think one more, the theater in Tennessee. One more time before we got married, and then. Yeah, being so then once you get married, things change a little bit. And as theater people, it's like you can choose to be together or not. not. Yep. <laughs> so I didn't I didn't like the not option. <laughs> um, but after being on the road and like, you know, handful of voice lessons a week, it's I just it I needed to be doing something different. And so we decided that I would go ahead and go for a master's degree. Mm. So um, that was that process. So we ended up in um, China and South Korea with the tour of Les Mis and wow. came back to the States. And it was like two weeks before I moved into our apartment in Penn State. So it was like crazy timing. Yeah, yeah. crazy timing. Um, so went to Penn State. My husband's on the road and we saw I don't think we went more than I think three weeks was like the maximum that we went without seeing each other. Um, usually it was like two weeks No, So, um, yeah, got a degree. I was a a grad assistant there. So it was, the degree was paid for. So that was pretty cool. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. And health insurance. So important. That was a great gig. Yeah. Yeah. So at what point did you decide that you wanted to start your own business? That was many years in the future. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so backtracking then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got I got my degree from Penn State and in vocal pedagogy because again, like that's bringing in that medical mm-hmm. part of my life that I always wanted. Uh, because Explain it's pedagogy for pedagogy. It's di- diagnosing and correcting vocal faults or problems, but it's very much like you learn about all of the anatomy in this region of the, <laughs> of the body. Like, that's all I know. Um, I did have an anatomy class in high, sc- in high school and loved it. So it was right up, right up my alley. Some vocal pedagogy programs actually work on cadavers. Um, Penn State did not. Um, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what I would think about that. <laughs> but I didn't have to worry about it because we didn't do that. But um, so it's, it's being able, like, to know what's going on inside. Right. Um, so it's just like that higher level of understanding and vocal health type things. And I can hear when there's a problem often and usually know what it is. (laughs) Well, I don't know. Mm. Not a vocal problem, but (laughs) I'm just kidding. Um, mostly when singing though, sometimes when actually the speaking voice is obviously very closely connected. So oftentimes I will have to work with a student on the way they're speaking <laughs> mm. because it's not serving them well when they're singing. Um, so, yeah, that's what that was. What are some practices that people do for fun or for cool effect that is god awful for your voice? Ooh, well, any kind of screaming is bad. Um, any kind. Well, yeah, I mean excessively that's the thing like knowing what is what is a healthy amount Mm. and what is not 
Um, yeah, I was going to mention someone that went to school here that I taught, but maybe I won't, um, who was in a, a band and had like a pretty, pretty good following and would just like the sound was was his sound. And you don't like I don't want to change what's already working for him. Right. But I want to make sure that he has longevity in his career. Of course. And so did his voice change after our training? Yeah, a little bit, but also made sure that he was aware of like, you know, this is the healthiest way you can do this. And if you do this, if you go this far and do like, you know, kind of grovelly screaming, screlting, right. like scream belting, um, then you need to do this afterwards to make sure that you heal what you've just done. So mm. it's kind of, a balance. But I think the biggest thing that people do, even in their speaking nowadays, and I find that I do it myself as well, um, but just that like lower pitch, like talking, fry, and then the vocal yes, fry comes yeah. in, and like that's not helping, <laughs> not helping any kind of health in there. So, what does it do to your vocal thing. cords? That makes they, it so they They literally like, um, <laughs> we're, you know, nobody's seen what I'm doing here, but your vocal cords are like hitting and smacking together in a way that is not healthy for them to do so so typically like there's this nice gliding undulating pattern right. when you're singing and then you're just making them like a hit and rub in ways that you know not. it's going to cause a blister or you know like a, that could happen. a nodule or note yeah yeah oh that sounds painful oh yeah that's bad oh don't want that to happen never vocal <laughs> fry ever again yeah <clears throat> So, yeah, so back to the the chronological history. Graduated, uh, we were on the road for a while with our newly born son and decided, and the dog. And the dog. <laughs> <laughs> we had, yeah, we had the dog actually first. Um, yeah, she, she, was, she was a great road dog. Uh, a lot of people in the cast had dogs and mm. it just, you know, that companionship and... Right. Whatever. So they were all friends. We'd take them to whatever dog park they had in the town that we were in and they'd play and it was a good time. Uh, So, yeah, dog and a a baby and um, eventually decided that we were going to buy a house and that we would buy a house in Lancaster because David had a, a, you know, solid group of friends here from Sight and Sound. Mm. I grew up here, like the area. It's like, well, if we're going to live here, we're going to live in Hemfield because that's a great school. That's where I went to school. So we bought a house, and he was still on the road, and I was here, started a voice studio. He came off the road and then did uh, Sight and Sound for a while. Um, and then I took a day job at um, a Christian school teaching music and directing choirs and doing the shows. So... This is like, you know, God's plan for my life, not having any idea what was going on. Um, Actually, I didn't mean to take the day job. (laughs) Someone contacted me and was like, hey, I I took a soccer coach position at the school. That's what happened first. Did coaching and the music teacher was leaving Mm. and the head administrator was leaving. Somebody new was coming in. So one of my friends (laughs) gave my name to the new administrator was like, hey, you need to hire this person for your music teacher. And so I got a phone call saying like, hey, will you come in and meet with the board and whatever? I was like, um, I, I don't know if I want to do this. I never wanted to teach middle school. Really? And that's why I didn't get a degree in music education. <laughs> it's like, if I teach, I want to teach in college. I don't want to teach. I don't want to teach. I just, I just wanted to teach people that wanted to be there. Fair enough. As opposed to, you know, middle schoolers right. that are forced to be there. Uh, so um, went to this interview. I don't even I don't even know why I did, but I did. And they they loved me and they offered me a job. And I said, OK, well, I actually have this audition coming up. So let me just go to this audition and see what's going on. So it was an audition for a company, Stephen Sondheim Musical mm-hmm. on Broadway. Which at the time they were taking an out of town cast and bringing them to Broadway, and that happens all the time. But then they have to cast understudies, or you know, swings, covers, whatever you want to call them. <clears throat> so they were going to hire covers, and one person would cover three roles. 
which meant that cover had to play multiple instruments. Do you see where this is going? This is where, yep. So I'm like, oh, if if ever, <laughs> if ever there's a moment for me on Broadway. It's now. And up to this point, I had had several callbacks for Broadway shows. Um, yeah, like the funniest story was I was in New York with my newborn son and auditioning for a show. I don't even remember what show it was. But in the same building, it, there was, you know, always multiple auditions going on. There was an audition for Mamma Mia. And my dad was always wanting me to audition for that show. Loves ABBA, loves the music. I was like, no, that's not, that's not me. I'm not going to do that. Well, it was right there. So right. I was like, sure, why not? So went in, and so they had so many girls there. I don't even know if it was. It must have been like a Sophie call, which is like the main girl in the show. I don't know. Long story short, they had to type, which is where there are too many girls to sit and listen to. So they bring people in. And this is actually in Denise's monologue from Smoke on the Mountain. So like, they marched us in 10 to a row and looked up and down the line and said, you, little girl. So it was just like that. <laughs> They had, there were 10 of us in the room, literally stood in a line. They had a table. Two men stood there with our headshots and resumes. They'd look at our headshot, look at us, flip it over, look at the resume, look at us, go to the next person, talk a little bit, and decided who was going to stay and would get to sing. Wow. So here I am, like literally with a newborn, and <laughs> they're like these high school girls, college girls. I waited two years to go back for my degree. So I was like, four years out of high school. Mm. And here are these, you know, really young girls. Not that I didn't look young, but it was, I had a baby. Like it was just right. funny. So got to sing. And this is the story I tell my, my voice students all the time, like why you should be prepared, why you should have something from every genre in your book. The best I could come up with for this audition was someone to watch over me, which is a Gershwin song. And that's what I sang for my Mamma Mia audition. So, Mamma Mia was already running on Broadway. Fast forward three months, three months. I was in my grandma's apartment and I got a phone call that I got a call back for Sophie. And, <laughs> you know, here, prepare this, this and this, come on this date. So it was just like this crazy, crazy thing. Wow. So anyway, yeah. So I had had many callbacks and never landed the job. So this, this company, I'm like, okay, I'm playing upright bass, piano, and... What else did I play? I think probably violin. Mm. And uh, it, I got a call back. So I was like, wow, this is awesome. So I told like the guy who had offered me the job, I was like, I got a call back. So I, I mean, I have to do this. He's like, it's okay. We'll wait. It's like, okay. So went to a call back, got another call back. I was like, I got, I got another call back. Like I, you know. It's moving. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, it's okay. When God closes that door, we'll be. It was like, no, God's not closing this door. This is it. <laughs> wow. Fast forward, final callback. Everybody's in the room, like all, like the producing team, all of the people, like super scary. And there were four girls, and they were going to hire two. Mm. And we each played a different combination of instruments. So. It was the perfect, the perfect rejection because, I mean, clearly I didn't get the gig, right? Right, yes. So <laughs> it was the perfect rejection because I left that not thinking that I wasn't good enough, but just that it, it wasn't the right combination. It wasn't right. the right mix of instruments. So the other girl that didn't get it, like we became great friends and we're friends to this day. And she came down to Lancaster. We had, you know, had lunch and. That's awesome. Um, we bonded over our rejection. Uh, we've seen each other at multiple auditions since then. But um, yeah, so it was a great experience, almost opportunity. And then, and I saw it. You can watch it on like PBS or the Broadway HD. And it was not great. It was not a great oh, wow. show. Um, I think the current company is much better, um, which is closing now anyway. But um, <clears throat> yeah, so that was that. And so I took the job. And ended up there for 11 years, and I taught three-year-olds and four-year-olds, and then fifth through 12th grade, and I did choirs, would get in as much as I could. So, like, some years I was able to teach music theory. Some years I did, like, a, I don't know, general, like, performance practices class. Mm -hmm. um, they went from doing the show 
a musical once every other year to I was doing like two shows a year. I mean, a big show and then we would do like a review or right. something like that, which then turned into a talent show um, with the extra give <laughs> like that whole thing. So through those years and that small program, I ended up having to do everything by myself. So to like sometimes designing the posters to doing the programs, to making the tickets, to costuming, choreographing, all of the things. And so all of that prepared me. I kept thinking like, God, why? Why? <laughs> like, this is so hard. Right, and yeah. what is all of this for? And I started, like, people talk about the seven-year itch in marriage. And I never felt that in my marriage, but I felt it in my job. Mm. Like, after seven years, I was like, I feel like I shouldn't be here anymore, like that there's something else for me, but I didn't know what it was. And I stayed there a long time. And um, finally, it was just them, uh, a situation where I was going to acquire a lot more teaching and not be compensated differently for it. And um, I felt like I had taken the program as far as I could take it with what I had Mm -hmm. in budget and with help from parents or whatever and so I was like it, I think it's time I think it's time to leave so I left not really knowing what was next or what I was going to do other than we always had this idea for red accordion and so once I left then it was like what if I so my husband was teaching here and they have like a deal if you you know if your spouse wants to go to school here they can they can so I was like, what if I get what if I get a degree in business and learn more about it? Because I was so scared. I was so scared to start to start it. Because I didn't know what I was doing. So I was like, what if I get a degree? So then we decide, okay, maybe we're maybe we'll do this. So I went through the process and then they're like, oh, well, you have a master's degree, so this doesn't apply to you. You can't, you can't get a degree. I was like, oh, okay. It's only for people that don't have bachelors. So I was like, oh, okay. All right. So we're in Arizona on vacation. Like my parents live there visiting. And all of a sudden I get this email saying, oh, um, they've decided that that you can do it. And class starts Monday. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so I was like, oh, OK. Great. Um, so, yeah, I did like smushed the degree into how many semesters? Two, Two? maybe three, maybe three. Wow. I think it was three because I graduated in December. OK. So I doubled up on class. I was like, can I double up on classes? Because they were telling me how long it was going to take. I was like, I already have degrees. Like, do I still, like, do I have to take this class? Right. Or, like, so they're like, well, you probably, you could probably double up, like, based on your, your transcripts, like your grades, which mm-hmm. were much better in grad school. Uh, you could, you could double up and whatever. So that's what I did and finished in three semesters. And so learned every project that I did while I was in school here. Um, I geared towards Red Accordion. So like we had to, you know, build a business model or do a business plan or do a pitch or whatever. Like I was all real life. Like right. this is what I wanted to be. So all of the feedback that I got and everything was, you know, for something tangible and not like I would have been maybe in college. Like, I don't know, maybe I'll do a mowing business or I don't right, know, right, like of course. something. Yeah. So that was, that was very helpful. And so I graduated in December and I started, I think the official start date of the business was April 1st. Of course. So, yeah. So, yeah. And the, the whole red accordion thing yeah. was um, when, when my husband and I got married, you know, it's traditional to give each other a gift. And <laughs> when, when I met my husband, I was in, in Smoke on the Mountain, and there's an accordion in Smoke on the Mountain, but only the preacher plays it. Nobody else plays it. And I was um, looking into the future and some other shows that have accordion. I was like, I should learn how to play this. So I was learning how to play, but I didn't have one. And so my husband called me on the phone in the, um, in the hotel room. So like you usually get a hotel room to prep. Like all the girls are in there getting ready or wherever. So he called the room and he's like, go look in the shower. I was like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> so I went in the shower. There was like this case in there. So he gave me a red accordion. Oh, so that's awesome. When we were when we were trying to come up with a name, like I, I'm so against using like my own name for things. And 
we, we were going through all these possibilities and we're like, what if we call it Red Accordion? And so like through the years, like I'd talk to people about like, you know, opening my theater company or whatever. They're like, what would you call it? And I told them and always got good feedback and oh, well, that, I'll remember that. And yeah. yeah, things like that. So can't spell it, but right, people <laughs> remember I don't know it. it. Yeah. That's awesome. So, yeah. So we're kind of running out of radio time. So if you want to check out Jen and all of her upcoming projects, uh, what have you got coming up? Um, well, yeah, that's an interesting, interesting story. <laughs> Not too much. Once COVID happened, mm-hmm. live Red Accordion shows kind of got pushed to the side. We've done a couple virtual shows. Um, so right now, Red Accordion is mainly my voice studio. I do have a show that I still have the rights for that is sitting right there. And um, once I figure out what my children's lives look like (laughs) in the next little bit, um, that may or may not be happening. But if you're interested in voice lessons, yeah, you can go to my website and check out what I'm all about. That's redaccordion.com. And for those who can't spell accordion, that is (laughs) A-C-C-O-R-D-I-O-N. Yeah. And I've had many troubles trying to spell accordion. It's just that that O at the end. People want to make an A. An A, yeah. Accordion. Right, yeah. Yeah. Well, tricky. Right now, we're gonna play a few songs, and then we'll keep going on FacebookLive.com. If you want to follow us there, you can search up Facebook. Go to Facebook.com forward slash the story Corey Rosen. If you want to listen to Spotify, Apple. YouTube, even now, you can search up The Story, Corey Rosen. That's C-O-R-Y-R-O-S-E-N. Find us there. We're going to keep going after these few songs. This song is, I should introduce the song. <laughs> <laughs> this song is a song I wrote uh, two years ago during the pandemic where everything shut down and it was everything was going away. Everything uh, was crashing down, especially for us music folk. Yeah, no theater shows. No theater shows, <laughs> no live music, no nothing. And forget about Zoom. People say it's a substitute. Uh, virtual voice lessons, you know? Virtual choirs. <laughs> yeah, oh, goodness. God, yeah. no. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to figure out, uh, follow Dr. Bigley over Zoom in my house was oh, just yeah. nightmarish. That doesn't work. Not live. Not no. live. No, not at all. Uh, but... And so, but what I realized was that there is one thing that really remains, and that's God. Mm -hmm. And so, this is my song, You Remain. When I am weak, can no longer speak, you are there right beside me. When all hope is lost, and I can't bear the cost You are there Paying it for me And when things turn to dust And there's nothing to trust You are there Honest to me Oh, it's clear who you're meant to be You are my strength You are my faith When all things fade away You remain When I've been crying Everything is dying You are there Breathing life into
that was my song, You Remain. You can find that on all streaming platforms as well. But we're going to continue going on Facebook Live and talk about Red Accordion Studios. If you want to check that out, please be sure to follow us on Instagram or Facebook, facebook.com forward slash the story Corey Rosen. But we're going to get you guys back to the radio. So, what you mentioned that uh, throughout your college career here at LBC that you started planning the business model for Red Accordion Studios. What what are the some of the unique things that you have to plan or model for for a theater company slash vocal studios as mm. opposed to other businesses? Uh, there's a lot that's different. And one of the main things is the like your target audience or your target – I mean, I say audience because – theater right. but um your your target customer and there's a huge thing you have to go through to figure this out and it has to be very specific and all of that kind of stuff and for me the theater company that I wanted to create actually was me wanting to make something different for the actors mm. so I was kind of working from the inside out which is not really how you're supposed to do things but I'm like but that's what I want to do like I want to create opportunities for actors and pay them and that's you know pay them well fairly yeah and so that was that was the biggest motivator and just to have like create that um I don't know that that atmosphere that I wanted it to be like that was my main motivator in starting it um, and aside from like i love to put up shows <laughs> of course, <laughs> and, right. you know figure that out um yeah so who all did you take inspiration from or who all did you uh i don't know if this is a thing that you did but did you base look at other people's theater models and look at those at all and compare um a little bit i know that there was i know that there was some of that in my classwork um digging into things um and yeah, even so far as uh, just a, a mission statement, whoops, as I hit the, <laughs> that screen, um, a mission statement and things like that. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know that there was any, any one specific thing. It was more just from my own experiences mm. and then what the experiences of my students. So most of my voice studio are adults um, and they're professionals and they're working currently. So um, just seeing their experiences and their frustrations or, you know, or the good things that happen to them in various theaters or whatever. So through all of those things, through my students and through our own experiences, my husband and myself, um, just wanted to create something different. So then with, with that said, what are some of the mistakes that you had, you had seen make before and how can we work around that, prevent that? Or I think largely in the... Uh, the way that actors are used sometimes, <laughs> and I mean used. Right. Um, so uh, creating that space where they're, they're, they're honored for their work, they're compensated for their work, they're taken care of, they feel loved and appreciated, and also that they have a voice. Mm. Um, so uh, there are times, I mean, specifically the last live show that I did with Red Accordion was All Is Calm which is about the Christmas truce in 1914, mm -hmm. 1814. <laughs> What's 19, the right year? 1914. 1914. I was like, no way, that's not right. Um, 1914. And um, it, so there were, I think we had 13, 13 guys in the show, all acapella music um, with some spoken little monologues here and there. And, you know, you go into something like that, which is, is very abstract. There's not a specific storyline that you can follow through it um kind of like the the musical the civil war um which my husband was in on broadway and that was the first broadway show that i saw also oh wow um so it, it's so it's that taking that abstract and this is like in any in any show that i'm directing i can have an idea of what i want to do but until i see the people and put them up on the stage like I don't want to pigeonhole them into something that I had in my head or like this roadmap or whatever. I want to see what they bring because that's what that's the beauty of theater. Like that show that we did, All Is Calm, will never be again. Mm -hmm. And it's it's there for that moment, for that time with those people. I can do the show again 
which I would love to do, but it's not going to be the same. Right. And so I want to utilize the actors that I have in the best possible way and use what they bring to the table, um, whether that be, you know, with their talents or abilities or their, their thoughts or their ideas. So that's something that maybe is a little different. What is one thing you didn't expect when you went started this business? Um, hmm. I, I'm not sure if there was a lot that I didn't expect only because of what led up to it. Right. Um, in terms of all of my years putting shows up and actually the same space. So the church, um, went to Grace Church in Lidditz and, um, they were allowing me to use the space for Red Accordion. Awesome. So I had, I was used to doing shows in that space. And so that was something familiar and I knew what my limitations were there and, you know, things like that. Um, I had gone through like the ticket selling process before and I know Lancaster County is typical for buying tickets last minute or (laughs) yes, it is. Yeah. So, you know, whereas I had hoped it might be different, like I just, I had to remind myself of that when tickets were on sale for, especially the very first show, which was smoke on the mountain and know that it will be fine. I will have an audience. It's just not going to come immediately. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. I'm trying to think of something. I didn't expect. I mean, it's not like there weren't surprises along the way, but nothing that was noteworthy or big enough right. for me to remember it. Or maybe I just blocked it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then uh, a different question. How did you decide what shows you wanted to put on? Uh, what was the reason? Did you have, ever have to do research or mm-hmm. I assume so? Yeah. But. So the first show that I did was Smoke on the Mountain, <laughs> which was the first, you know, my first first professional show. Um, you know it in and out. Yeah. And by that point, other than doing several productions of it myself, I directed how many productions of it? Three productions before doing it for Red Accordion. So it was comfortable. It was familiar. Doesn't make it easy because that's a hard show having, mm. you know, to play all the instruments, finding the right actors and then training them on the instruments if they don't know how to play them. Um, so that's that's why I chose that first show because it's so special to me and is such it was a life changer for me and um I was excited to do that first so that's why I chose that one and in general Red Accordion like so far we've only really done ensemble shows mm-hmm. um other than maybe like a couple of the online shows that we did that maybe had a few lead characters, but the in-person ones like we did, um, I did three in my first season and then had a second season planned, which was 2020. Right. Of course. (laughs) So we had, I had actually, so the first year we did, uh, smoke on the mountain and I think it was in September or October and then follow and so this is 2019 so the end of 2019 like these were all October was the first one November September I don't remember this is bad um the next show I did was um the three little pigs yeah that's right I remember that one the musical yeah which was written by Drew's and Drew and Styles who wrote additional music for Mary Poppins and uh Honk they think they wrote Honk so great composers the show so fun so brilliant several lbc actors in that show um so we did that and then all is calm was december and had my season planned for the next year most mostly it was kind of funny because i look back and i remember not knowing exactly what i wanted to do and just really having trouble committing Mm. to a season and it's obviously a good thing because (laughs) What I had committed to, which wasn't an entire season, but that obviously didn't happen. Happened, but yeah. I had cast um, another TYA show, which is theater for young audiences. So performed by adults, but for young audiences. Um, it was Polka Dots, okay. a musical. Um, and it was cast. And I'm trying to remember, I, because our read through was done on Zoom. Mm. So... It was March. March ish. Yeah. And I think we were being optimistic. So we did the read through. And um and then I was trying so hard 
to get the licensing company to allow me to do a virtual production. Mm. And at that time, they weren't allowing it for that show. Um, since then, <laughs> right, of course. it is allowed. Um, yeah, so that that happened. It kind of um, halted things. I ended up giving up the rights to that show, but I kept the rights for the other show that I had planned, which is another actor musician piece and is an ensemble show, which shall remain kind of nameless, but you can dig and figure it out. <clears throat> but um, I still have the rights for that show. I, it's this, The score is currently in on my piano. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's like I'm itching to do that one. I have been. It's just going to be, it's a tricky one. I'm excited to do it, but I have no idea when it will happen. Right. So yeah, we moved to a couple online shows, which I did with kids, which um, didn't necessarily have a vision to do that. Um, but it just, I was seeing like these kids that wanted so badly, not that the adults didn't, but wanted so badly to be doing something and had everything taken from them. Right. And so I was like, I'm going to create, create this opportunity. So we did um, the Big 1-0 online edition, uh, which we d- recorded on Zoom. And it was, I mean, it was so fun. It really yeah. was. And so everybody had their little space in their house and they had their, you know, their costumes. And sometimes the music had to be played from their side oh. to sing with it. Sometimes they sent me recordings and then they were just lip syncing in videos. Like it's this whole thing. So I put them all together. Like they, there was choreography. Wow. They would send me videos and I'd put it all together in iMovie or not. I was using something different, but so there were big dance numbers and I don't do anything Touch. like, no, I don't, oh, I yeah. won't, I won't do something if it's not going to be awesome. Gotcha. <laughs> it's not going to be excellent. No. Like I got to put, it's got to be good be or I'm not going to put yeah, it right. out there. So not that it was like the best ever, but it was really good considering Same what we had and yeah. was learning, you know, how to do all of those things. So we did that. And then we did a show uh, towards the end, like before the world opened up called um, Super Happy Awesome News, <laughs> which it was um, written for, I mean, like during the pandemic and it's these for kids. The, yeah. Like okay. these kids, the this uh, sister realizing like how upset her parents are, how much stress they have, how like everything she hears on the news is bad and you know her sister's scared and she's like I'm going to start something that makes people happy so we're going to do this radio show or whatever TV show called Super Happy Awesome News and we're just going to report on everything that's happy and awesome and super so it really is um you can watch it on YouTube on Red Accordion's oh, cool. YouTube YouTube channel so yeah so it was it was a lot of fun really a lot of fun so as the world started opening up do you have any uh, plans or what is to be, what is next for Red Accordion Studios? Yeah. So as I mentioned before, largely <laughs> voice lessons, yeah. um, keeping that going. And some of my students are still virtual. So they've chosen that for the convenience of it, which is pretty nice. Yeah. Um, and I have, you know, a couple students that will be like, hey, can we do virtual today? Because I don't have time to drive to you or whatever. Um, and and yeah, so we've, we've figured it out and, um, yeah, I actually had one student that I never saw in person in my house. I mean, like I, I know her, like I'd known her previously, but, um, only ever taught her online. So, um, anyway, all of those things are happening, the voice lessons, but because, so my son just graduated from high school and I was helping with costuming with his show, um, this past year they did Wizard of Oz. And then he was in a dance show, Hemfield Does Dance Theater. So I was helping with costumes for all of that. Um, and then now, like I think I'd mentioned in my bio about like managing the careers of my children. So really that's kind of taken the priority right now. Mm. Um, my daughter actually has a super big callback audition in New York City next week. Um, and so it's just kind of like seeing how all of these things go and what kind of what our schedule looks like come fall and whether or not that allows me to be able to put up a show or not. (laughs) So family kids are kind of coming first with the, on the production side of things. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, Yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. What was it like to go from an actor to a director? That's a very good question. It was a, it was, there was a very specific shift to the very so again history 
The very first show that I put up, other than I was a student director on To Kill a Mockingbird in college and uh, staged the telephone, the opera. So my, the director allowed me to do the staging. Cool. So all the blocking. So those were my first little like Dabbles. dip my toe in, yeah, kind of thing. And I enjoyed it, but I never thought like, I'm going to love doing this one day. <laughs> did, not, did not have that thought. Um, so when I got the job at the, at the Christian school, I, the first show that I put up was Pirates of Penzance. So putting up this show by myself, conducting the orchestra, um, obviously it's helpful when like I've had training in conducting and, uh, play the instruments. Um, but it was, it was that moment. And actually I joke that the first time I cry, well, not usually I'll have like one breakdown per show. Yeah. <laughs> one. And it didn't happen. I don't think it happened with the Red Accordion show. It might have happened with Smoke on the Mountain, like the whole like people aren't buying tickets thing. I'm failing. Um, and I didn't fail. <laughs> and the business, like even my tax lady's like, wow, the first year business, like this is awesome. Good job. <laughs> but um I, when the moment I like feel that satisfaction or like they've arrived, meaning my cast is when the audience laughs for the first time, mm. they laugh at my cat and I cry. <laughs> like they're, they're laughing at them. Oh, they, they're funny. <laughs> it's <working>. so, but <laughs> like, it was, yeah. yeah, it was like, you know, through that first time, that first show realizing like, I'm, I think I'm getting as much, if not more satisfaction after seeing and at the time it was kids, high schoolers and a few middle schoolers seeing these kids on the stage than I do when I'm on the stage. Wow. So that was that was kind of the shift. And I I just love creating. And I do, I mean, I do I do lots of things. Yes. <laughs> like the do. the joke that I'm like the gen of all trades, master of none. Like I love that's awesome. Yeah, love <laughs> costuming. I do photography. Terrible I do, trends. yeah, like all of the. Th I love to learn new things. I love to learn. Mm -hmm. Actually, my dream jo dream job would be. Do you know what a secret shopper is? No. So it's like someone that's paid to go into a store and buy something, and then like report about their experience. Kind of oh, thing. okay, gotcha, gotcha. So like my dream job, yeah, is to be like a secret student, mm. like online classes or whatever that I take the class. So therefore I'm learning, but then I'm paid to give my feedback on how things went. So that's cool. Cause then I'm, yeah, learning. I don't know if that's a thing, but if anyone out there wants a secret student, <laughs> <laughs> I'm available. Um, yeah. I also actually work for a, an online ballet company for adults. So it's like an, um, adults learning ballet that's cool and uh i do content creation and graphic design and um yeah design her merchandise i'm actually doing a magazine for her right now um so that's like my little part-time side gig plug, plug that um i i yeah sure it's broche ballet it's called b-r-o-c-h-e so yeah broche ballet it's ballet for grown it's actually very cool so her her motivation and i identified with her so much that I was like, I want to do this part-time job that she wants, even though it doesn't pay a ton. Right. Like it satisfies that need for me to do be more. creative, yeah. but also learn because I've learned lots of things that I didn't know how to do. Like I didn't know how to design a magazine and I'm of doing course. it. <laughs> um, and yeah. And, and so, you know, here she is like this woman and trying to make all this stuff happen, but she realized like adults that want to learn, there's no, there's no track for them. It's like, mm -hmm. go to this like open class or this drop-in class, but they don't get the, the curriculum Yeah, that, that kids get. And so that's what she's created. And she had in-person studios and then, you know, was kicked to online, of course, with of course. COVID and then decided like, hey, this is what's working for me. So she did, does that. And then she just did um, the first annual International Adult Ballet Festival in Miami, Florida. Oh, wow. And yeah, so that was like a huge life-changing thing for her. And like, yeah, I got to design all the merch for everybody. That's so incredible. Yeah, so it's, it was, that's a fun, a fun thing. <laughs> so um, another fun thing is, is trying to get children to learn. Mm -hmm. 
how did you manage to do that? There's they're sponges and they learn things faster than adults do. So it's true. Yeah. And it's funny when I was teaching um, all the different ages, like I was also teaching here. So in a given day, I'd teach like three year olds and then teach like a 20 year old. Mm. And they're not all different. It's just like the enthusiasm level maybe changes a bit. But wow, did my like three and four year olds love opera. Loved it. Middle schoolers, not so much. Right. So, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, I'm a, a, I a, can be a loud and very enthusiastic person. So just being a little crazy in the classroom. and. So what was the, some of the exercises that you would do, some of the trainings, the routines that to get limber into uh, singing? Um, well, actually, towards the end of my – my classroom teaching career, we'd go from the kids would go from school to rehearsal right after school. And sometimes it was hard to get them to like refocus Mm. or focus on something different. They'd want to talk about their day or they would just, you know, start to crash. And, you know, in that 15 minute window in between. So I don't know why I didn't think about this earlier, but you've heard of Just Dance. Yeah. So you can find videos on YouTube of these things. Obviously you're not scored if you're dancing along with them, but I had a big projector in my room with a big screen. And so I would just put on a couple of those videos and as the kids would come in, they would just get up and they'd start dancing. And so they were warming up their bodies and, you know, getting refocused onto what was going to happen. And it was like the perfect situation. The song would be over and be like, okay, here we go. And I don't know why I didn't think of that sooner. But that that was one of my good ideas. And then another one, which I regretted a little bit after doing it, my middle school boys in particular (laughs) would not want to sing out. Mm. Go figure. Very odd, right? Middle school boys don't want to sing out. So I had the brilliant idea of getting them each a kazoo. (laughs) So I was like, (laughs) that way they're not singing. But they're, I mean, they're humming. Mm-hmm. They're, I know if they are learning the pitches and the rhythms and they don't have to feel self-conscious about what their voice sounds like or whether it's going to crack or whatever. <laughs> um, yeah. So then, of course, everybody wants, so every single student, like in their little cubby with their choir folder, had their own kazoo. Oh, that's awesome. But when you hear a choir of kazoos, like. It's a little wild. Yeah. So, yeah, those are some of the things I did. What's the differences between teaching like three to four year olds to teaching 20 uh, and then even older? Yeah, there's not much difference. No, not really. <laughs> it's it's funny. I The things that work well for both or, yeah, I mean, honestly, there's not. Maybe my level of enthusiasm or craziness changes with each age group a little bit, but mm. not a lot. I Because I was an athlete – um, I am very like singing is a whole body activity. For sure. And I joke with like my newer students in my studio, like, you know, who has studied with me for the longest or for a while when I play like the first chord to start singing, like, you know, vocal exercises and whatever that they immediately start moving or they'll grab, like I have exercise bands, mm. like, uh, TheraBands exercise balls like just never know what what I might make them do or pull out but it's very very physical so I think sometimes as we age um, especially like you know junior high to high school even afterwards even like after college like we become self-conscious reserved we stop that moving I just heard um, trying to think of who it was uh, a, a famous dancer and I can't think of who it was but um, say when when did when did you decide that you're not that you weren't a good dancer? Mm. Because if you watch kids, like they just dance uninhibited, and yeah, they think they're great. So she's like, you know, in her point, it, kind of the same thing with singing. When did you decide you're not a, not a good singer or you can't sing? Because right. you know we're born <laughs> doing that singing or a joke that my daughter came out that way, scream singing, right. <laughs> and yeah. But it's it's that type of thing. So just it's a lot of that's the psychology piece mm. as well. So I mentioned like wanting to study medicine or psychology or music. 
and God wrapped them all up in the guise of a voice teacher. So it, I mean, people come in, you don't know what they're coming from in their day, what just happened to them, what stresses they have, what, you know, anxiety, whatever. And it's not my intention to have them leave that outside, but to bring it in and to kind of work through it or use it and um, just kind of be in touch with all of that as we're working because that's that's life. That's reality. Yeah. And what better way to work through difficult issues than singing your heart out yeah. or yeah. getting that anger, pent up tension out. Yeah. Through- and that's where, like, they'll start moving and be like, oh, my goodness, like, this hurts so, so bad. Yeah. Well, that's because, you know. <laughs> because you're stressed. Yeah. So. It's crazy. The uh, Whenever I start moving around for, for whatever reason, I'm like, ow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Whoa, what's going on oh there? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's aging. Yeah. <laughs> Something different every day. For sure. <laughs> So I have some general questions, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. What? How has your faith been challenged or grown throughout your career? Hmm. I feel like all actors or performers are <laughs> have that both aspects. Um, I don't know that my faith has ever been challenged, which hmm. is interesting, and kind of back to that chat we had about going from my Christian bubble to like regional theater world, um, God has somehow protected me from any desire to do anything like bad or compromising or anything. I don't I, like, there's no other explanation other than God is just like, you know what, Jen, I'm going to protect you from all of that. And thanks God. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, obviously, just obvious faith growth from like stepping out into something that I, you know, you don't know if it's going to work. You don't know if it's going to fail or succeed. And you just have to trust that that's what God has been preparing you for or that he's placed for you for this time. And it may or may not work out how you thought it was going to, but there was a reason behind it, uh, you know, as evidenced, you know, in everything that I talked about today, like, you know, I didn't. Didn't know that, you know, not getting that Broadway gig was going to lead me into opening my own theater company or learning how to do graphic design and, you know, all of these things. Like, I never could have imagined that. I never could have imagined this, like, where I am right now in my life, partially because of technology <laughs> that changes. But, yeah, so just a constant, like, having to rely on God. Like, you know, I know you know what's best for me. This rejection really hurt. It yeah. really hurt. But again, what is this in light of eternity? And you just, you keep going or you shift gears. (laughs) So what is, uh, in light of that question, what is worship to you? How would you define that? (sighs) Worship is, is daily life. I mean, it's every, every movement, every action. It's, it's appreciating God's God's creation, it, being being an artist or a creative, um, it's like when you ask for three words to describe what I do. Yeah, exactly. Yep. <laughs> um, I just throw like creative in there. I don't know what to call myself. Like, what do? How do I? I don't know. Um, just knowing. Let me know. You know, our creator <laughs> created all of this stuff, so it's it's innate in us, and so I feel like any any creation, any spark of ideas is you know, from God and it can be worshipful. It's taking care of my children, which looks different now than it did 10 years ago. Um, that it's, it's all worship. It's all service. It's it, well, it can be, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, for me, it is, it, it, it has to be. Yeah. So what is one thing that you know now that you wish you had known when you first started? That everyone brings something unique to the table that you shouldn't try to be like someone else Mm. because we already have that person. (laughs) It's kind of like, you know, a Kristen Chenoweth or a, um, I don't know, Sutton Foster. We already have those people. So if, if someone wants a Sutton Foster type, they're going to cast Sutton Foster. (laughs) Right. Of course. Yeah. So, um, if you want a Jen Felty type, then cast Jen Felty. There you go. So yeah. Kind of be yourself. 
What are three musicals that you would recommend everyone should see? Mm, goodness gracious. Uh, I do not have favorites. I really don't. Mm. And I can find something to love about everything or learn from everything. Oh, my goodness. I guess I'd have to say Smoke on the Mountain. Yeah, that's what I was saying. That's what I at least one of them. <laughs> but it's so funny. Like, I first watched a videotape of it, a, an actual VHS tape, and I... I was I I did I was I was wondering what in the world did I get myself into like before I went down to do the show. Oh wow! And then I sat there in the audience to watch it, which you don't always have the you don't always have that opportunity. But right. the show was running, so I had the opportunity to watch it, and I laughed harder than I've laughed in my whole life. Like and a live theater, right? You have to see it live. Um, but yes, so that show. Um, goodness i i don't know i just have to go with the ones that are somewhat recent for me all is calm all of the shows go see all go of the see shows all the shows i mean they seriously like we just yeah. saw anastasia that and i had i had no idea what to expect from it i kind of remembered the movie um yeah <laughs> it was i mean it was it was it was wonderful to see and just to see the plot lines and then be like, Ooh, that part's kind of like lame is. And mm. Oh wow. That's, that's like a lot like my fair lady. And that. <laughs> so just kind of comparing and identifying and getting ideas and being inspired. And that's what live theater is supposed to do. Start a conversation. Yeah. So last question, what was one of the most funny things that ever happened to you on stage or maybe one of the worst things that ever happened to you on stage? On stage. I don't, or during a show at all. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I really only have two two times that I remember that something went like it wasn't supposed to. And one was only like where I it sounded like I cracked singing. And it definitely wasn't a crack. I mean, I guess you could characterize a crack this way. But it was um, in this show called Pirates and Pinafores which was an original show at the theater I was working at. And it was um, all Gilbert and Sullivan material. Mm. So Gilbert and Sullivan and their producer, Doily Cart, were on stage creating each show. And as they would create each show, the show would appear. And then you'd see a few songs from each show. And then it'd go back to them at the piano creating. Yeah. So I played several of the ingenue roles. And one, and we were doing what they call a kitty matinee, which is a 10 a.m. show for kids. And I had to sing a high note and sustain it, which I did. But then Flem had something else in mind. In and so like Flem yep. came through, cut off the sound, it cleared, and then the sound came back out again. So that was just like a weird, like I had no control over it. It it's was Flem. Yeah. So kind of, it's, you know, not, not the best thing when you're saying, you know, sustaining oh a high God. note and that happens. Um, the other thing was just when I was at the Ryman, Smoke on the Mountain, you're on stage the whole time. I was sick. And I, I have never been sick for a show before and was not sure if I could make it being oh, wow. on stage the whole time without having to run off and run to the bathroom. <laughs> and I, oh my goodness, I ended up having to leave the stage, but it was during each character has a monologue. That's like an extended monologue, like a good okay. five minute chunk of time. And it was in the second act, and my character was upset because we had got in trouble for dancing, which we weren't doing. Um, and so I came out for this act two, and I was supposed to be upset anyway. So I just had to act my way through it and pretend like I was still upset, and I had to go outside and whatever. <laughs> so right. I had to leave the stage. And then, you know, there I'm leaving my actors wondering if I'm coming back on. And they're all sitting there thinking, okay, how are we going to cover for her for the next song? And I was able to make it back on and it was fine, but I think it was probably worse for them than it was for me. Right, of course. <laughs> Not knowing if I was going to show up again, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Other than playing a KKK member in one of the shows that I was in. So that was, that was interesting. Also, that show, it was called WMKS, Where Music Kills Sorrow. And it was a radio station. Really? And yeah, I was in the, the band for the radio station. And my eyeshadow was like bright blue so there's a moment where there's you know there's um 
trouble happening and the, you know the band is the one who gets up the three of us go outside and check on what's going on and then all of a sudden three kkk members come in <laughs> so you could see my like bright blue eyeshadow through the holes in my hood yeah it was it was interesting that show it's it's interesting to see uh the show the showtime periods like ragtime or yeah. still in or uh ruby mm-hmm. uh that yeah. musical yeah and just to see how weird it is i mean it's seeing having an eye for stuff in the past that actually happened yeah right and then having to wrestle with that because ragtime i think Terminal stage is doing that yeah uh, coming up. Mm-hmm. it's a rough show to get through yeah there's yeah a lot of shows like that and it does kind of kind of bugs me when they try to change it mm. because things are different now and they try to make it a little more politically correct or Whatever. And I'm like, but that's, but that's what it was. Why can't we look at what it was and then have a dialogue about it? Right. Like it's part of, it's part of history. This, oh, they did that. Oh, how offensive that is. But at that time it wasn't offensive. And what have we learned from this? Like, that's what, that's what it's about. And we lose that when they're trying to try to make changes. And most of the time those shows are made to point out that how wrong it was in the first place by, by softening it. You're not only you're not only doing a disservice to history, mm-hmm. but you're you're taking away uh, the the tragedy and the and the point of the show. Yeah. Uh, because it was god awful. It was abhorrent. It it's supposed to make you feel uncomfortable. Yeah. You should have realized that when you went to that show. Right. Yeah. And that's where uh, I mentioned Polka Dots, the musical. It's it was written by two guys in their dressing room on Broadway. I don't know what show they were in, but. It's about like the whole idea of segregation and like the whites only water fountain and Mm. the blacks only water fountain and whatever. So but in this show, it's there's a girl. I might get this backwards, but a girl with polka dot skin that goes to a school, changes schools and everybody at the school has square skin, like Mm. square shapes on their skin. So it's a way to like get kids to realize like, hey, look at this. Isn't this silly that she can't drink from this water fountain? Just because, yeah. yeah. So it's kind of like a, a a modern take on like, yeah, teaching teaching something historical. That's so interesting. Yeah. Well, hey, this has been a lot of fun. Yeah. Please be sure to check out uh, Red Accordion Studios if you want voice lessons, or and to see a um, show. Hopefully, see a someday. show. <laughs> Working it back up. With all that said, I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Be sure to check out tomorrow. I'm going to be having on a, a, an awesome guitar player called uh, Shane Spiel. He is the the quoted I, uh, grandfather, I guess fa- father or grandfather, I can't remember which. <laughs> but uh, he start he is the main guy behind the the cigar box guitar movement. Awesome. Creating guitars out of what he has some of the most incredible guitars. So cool. S- some stuff made out of boat oars, out of skateboards, out of shovels. Nice. I could use them in some of my shows. That would be awesome. He's local. <laughs> so check him, check him out tomorrow. It's starting at 10 o'clock, 1030. That is 10 o- 1030 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great time. It's a great time. <laughs> <laughs> but it, and if you want to check out uh, all of our future guests and events, please go to our Instagram at the underscore story underscore podcast or facebook.com forward slash the story Corey Rosen. If you want to listen to us on Spotify, Apple, whatever, ch- just look up the story Corey Rosen at C-O-R-Y-R-O-S-E-N. And if you really want to support what I do, please be sure to check out our merchandise on our Facebook and buy a shirt or hoodies and support the business. With all that said, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day, and I'll see you guys later. Bye.